Good afternoon, everyone. As you can see, I have a summer research connection student uh, working under my mentor, she debates at Young Toro Lab. Um, and what I've been doing these past few weeks is investigating how uh, lactobacillus brevis, a specific type of lact uh, lactic acid producing bacteria, which is mostly found in yogurt and such, how it's how what's fed to the sulfur and uh, common food plate species, how that modulates the ornithine levels of it, um, which I will explain later what ornithine actually is. So, the background information. Gut microbiome affects host metabolism. Of course, as modern research has shown, gut, the gut microbiome plays a very important and vital role in the metabolism of animals. But unfortunately, in, again, until rather recently, this role has been understudied. Um, but we knew that it's definitely had effects on the system, but we didn't understand to the very large extent that it plays in animal metabolism. And also, we once thought that many such microbes formed a commensal relationship with their hosts, meaning the host didn't really benefit or benefited very little from having a, these gut bacteria. But the gut bacteria, they have most of the benefits. But as time has gone on, and again, with modern research, it is, we have far more of a picture of a mutualistic relationship between host and gut microbiome. And those are just various common species of gut, micro, of gut bacteria. <clears throat> so now we know that the host mutually benefits from gut bacteria. And so uh, changes in the uh, host gut environment, whether they be pH level, different diet, even changes in the diverse species of the day, you know, ecological uh, diversity. Once these change, uh, microbes will often adapt to such changes via different uh, metabolic pathways, you know, creating different byproducts, maybe to try and change the pH of the surroundings or find new energy sources or such. Uh, and some of these pathways produce uh, chemical byproducts, which may in fact be useful to the host organism. Once absorbed through the gut line, they may serve some sort of purpose in the host organism. So, why is ornithine important and what is ornithine? Ornithine is a compound found within many, and many animals, it's an amino acid. Uh, and out within, you know, mammals and insects. In Drosophila specifically, fruit flies, one of these is important for the animal's growth cycle. This action, the actual pathways it's used in is mostly amino acid synthesis and, uh, you know, building proteins and such. Thus, one of these though naturally produced by sophila, can also be supplemented by microbial secretions from its gut, which is why it's interesting to us to measure in drosophila, uh, because specifically what, what our lab, Jim Toro lab, is interested in is uh, metabolic signals and how they change growth patterns in organisms. And so, as you can see, lactobacillus produce, uh, secretes ornithine. It secretes ornithine as a byproduct of the ADI pathway, which is a metabolic pathway lactobacillus uses to 
convert ADP into ATP, effectively uh, producing energy, well, actually producing energy. It fixes ADP to store energy. It's far time to energy rather. And so what this, in, what this means is that this very common, probably relatively common, pathway in macular bacillus is it, you know secretes all of the rather commonly. I think it I think orthopene is actually one of the most common secretions of microbacillus, um just as waste products and byproducts. So yes, so you can see why. So summary. Microbiome of an organism, of course, affects its metabolism. This microbiome relationship has been shown to be mutualistic in many cases. Ornithine plays a vital role in the growth cycle of the solva, and Bacillus brevis secretes ornithine, which may absorb through the gut lining, increase ornithine levels in the solva. So as you can see, it all falls into place. Lactobacillus and Drosophila, my uh, Lactobacillus is not actually occurring in the gut of Drosophila, but once introduced, they may share a mutualistic relationship where all of them plays this role uh, as a byproduct once uh, absorbed by Drosophila is out of the growth. And so, thus, my project in the lab was to determine how, by how much, by what percentage, say, or something, how much feeding that the service credits to the software actually increases all of these levels in the software. Experimental procedures. So, first part. 48 adult fruit flies were placed into vials containing glasses, medium, and uh, lactobacillus. The certain uh, variety I used was called LB6, and left to feed for 24 hours. Then, 40 of those flies, so that would be four replicates of treated flies, uh, fed with LB6 and another four replicates of untreated control flies, meaning 80 flies in total of uh, or homogenization, in order to uh, make measuring the levels of all of them far more just easy. It means that effectively it produces a slurry. A solution of why. <laughs> so the resulting homogenates are then subjected to the Chenard assay. The Chenard assay was developed in 1952 uh, by Pierre Chenard in order to measure certain levels of certain amino acids using colorometry. So Thus, what we use to measure the order of the levels in the resulting fly projects is the Chenard assay. So that involves uh, three groups in the well plate, which would be a, the control flies, the control replicates, the control homogenates, the treated homogenates. And then a baseline solution of varying concentrations of ornithine. And so 24 wells each filled with uh, 100 microliters of fluid. Then the plate is read in a colorometry machine at, 50, at 550 nanometers, which is the optimal uh, wavelength for reading ornithine, I suppose. Finally, results. 
Back to the bacillus brevis, in fact, it does increase all of these levels in flies. So, all of these concentrations in the fly homogenate between the treated fly homogenate and the untreated fly homogenate, it increased on an average by 225%. Um, I believe scaling that down to the individual fly, the difference between the average um, untreated singular fly and treated fly would be about an increase of 150% in levels of warning. And thus, this experiment was generally successful. Thank you for coming, and I am now open to questions. In the in the, about halfway through, you said that you said the ornithine to forty eight slides, but then you um, mentioned, oh, okay. <laughs> but then you mentioned that you only used forty of slides. For the yes. actual test. Is there a reason for that? Okay, so for one, I the flies were not fed ornithine, they were fed lactobacillus. Ornithine is a secretion of lactobacillus and is what is measured for the action of um, lactobacillus on the growth cycle of flies. And also, uh, I used 48 treated flies and then reduced that to 40. Uh, the eight flies were just basically at the allowable margin of error. Uh, yeah. yeah, just like maybe a fly did do so well that the thing. Yes. Extra. Yeah. Yes. You've got it. Any other questions? What did you learn from the summer that surprised you? Um, what did I learn from the summer that surprised me? Well, I mean, I guess just generally, um, the software of uh, fascinating animals and just their usage as a model organism to basically scale down and simplify understanding a alien biology, even though it's not totally uh, congruous amongst them, but it's still a good model. I just find it amazing. Uh, kind of surprised that you don't ever realize how generally similar your organs are to a fly. <laughs> uh, is this your first time working in such close uh, capacity with flies? Yes, it was my first uh, And what was that like? Working with uh, food flies. What was it like? It was definitely interesting. Um, in my experiences, the uh, food flies are actually rather easy animals to control. Um, in fact, another interesting thing is, is because they're resistant to hypoxia. The only anesthesia you really need for them is just carbon dioxide. So, yeah. I think that closes my presentation up then. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Liz Verdana, and I'm from Mayfield Senior School. I'm also part of Gunfora Lab, and my graduate mentor is Yu Tian. Um, here at, as for the SOS program, my project was about activating uh, limb regeneration in, with Ictaizen. 
So our lab researches ways to activate living generation. We use a biological model, uh, which you heard previously, which is Drosophila melanogaster, which you'll commonly know as fruit flies. And shockingly, there are pretty good biological models, uh, if you believe it or not. Um, we actually share about 60% of our DNA with them, and they've previously been used in cancer research, disease research for Alzheimer's and Huntington's, um, as well as sleep-wake cycle research. But the most important thing for our lab is the fact that adult flies do not naturally regenerate limbs, and shockingly enough, us as humans don't either. So at Gintaro Lab, we try to coax the beginnings of regeneration. To give a little background on how we do amputations, here's a diagram of the fly leg. So there's six legs on the fly, and it is in three distinct parts, the femur, the tibia, and the tarsus. We amputate right in the center of the tibia. Uh, this is for a couple of reasons, because amputating at the femur typically will result in a higher likelihood of death, um, and that's not something we want. And the tarsus doesn't have a lot of muscle, uh, so that's kind of difficult to work with for regeneration. And amputating at the center of the tibia, which in a human equivalent would be around your shin, also allows us to see if there's any joint regrowth um, between the tibia and the tarsus. So some previous work in the lab, uh, you can see that this is a control. So this is kind of the baseline that we use for what typically happens in flies that are untreated. So uh, control flies, which don't have anything special given to them, um, then amputated, normally scab, and then don't grow, uh, which isn't surprising. Uh, you can see in the image there on the side at zero days post-amputation, as well as 22 days post-amputation, that the only real difference is that the tip of the um, leg, where the amputation site is, has just turned into a dark black color. And that's what we kind of use as our um, indicator of a scab. Also previously, my mentor, Yutian, along with the other researchers, um, did this experiment where they fed leucine, glutamine, which are amino acids, along with insulin. Uh, to different amputated flies. And what was interesting was they actually saw some signs of regrowth. Um, and alongside this, they saw that there was altered wound healing. So typically, like I mentioned, you would see a scab. However, in this case, the um, there was no scab. It was a clear tip or lighter brown color is what we classify as an unscabbed fly. Um, and those that were unscabbed actually have actually had some regrowth, which is why we use unscabbed flies as kind of an indication for the potential to regrow. Oh, and there's the image. You can see at zero days post-amputation, as well as 14 days post-amputation, um, and the difference in the tip color as well as the length. So my project kind of came out of this background. Um, my mentor, Yu Jian, uh, wanted to find out if there was or, or what was potentially causing the differences in regenerative capacity between those that were treated and those that were untreated. So what she did was she took scabbed flies that were the control flies along with those that were unscabbed and treated and RNA sequenced them. And the summary of results is shown on the graph on the side. Um, and what this essentially shows is, is a graph that shows the differences in the genes between those that are uh, unscabbed and treated and those that were scabbed. And essentially what she found was that a couple of genes were upregulated or um, expressed more in unscabbed treated flies. Um, and those are the little circles that appear on the graph. And you can see that there's a little cluster in the corner and you might be wondering why that is. Uh, they're clustered together because they share a common thread and that common thread happens to be that they're related to something called ictisin signaling. So what my project wanted to find out was if ictisin itself can promote regrowth. So you might be wondering, what is ictisin? And ictisin is a steroid hormone that regulates growth as well as reproduction in all sorts of insects. But the most interesting thing is that ictisin is 
there's almost a human equivalent um, to Dyson for us, which is um, another steroid hormone. The three most common ones that you'll uh, be familiar with are testosterone, progesterone, and estrogen. And they're not only similar in structure, but they're also pretty similar in function to a Dyson, um, and that is growth and production. And you can see that there are uh, pictures showing the differences and similarities between Dyson and testosterone. And while this may be something that can be applied way in the far future, hopefully this research can be used to find uh, a human equivalent or be a stepping stone towards that research. So the general procedure for my experiment goes as follows. I amputated exclusively female flies. Um, this was to avoid sex bias and amputated at the center of the tibia. Uh, that was like the diagram shown before. Then various concentrations of ignizin would be prepared. Uh, this was using a powdered form of activated ignizin. Um, then they would be dissolved in water. And then 0 0.1 milliliters would be added to standard molasses food. Um, and you can see the image there. The standard molasses food with nothing added would be used as control. So to kind of find out what concentration we wanted to focus on, uh, we first had to test out different concentrations. So there's the five concentrations that I listed above, and that's the five that we tested. Uh, the reason why we chose these numbers is because 0 0.3 milligrams per milliliter uh, actually came from a different published paper that was studying the concentrations of Eudizin during larval development of Drosophila. And they found that 0 0.3 milligrams per milliliter was one of the most ideal concentrations. So we kind of took that as our baseline and then added a couple of higher concentrations as well as a couple of lower concentrations. Then we amputated the flies, put them in the vials, and at three days post amputations, recorded the scabbed and scabless rate. And so here are the results shown below. Um, as you can see, there are some that were a little bit similar, but we ended up choosing to focus on 0.3 milligrams per milliliter simply for the fact that not only did it seem pretty um, effective for our experiments, but it also seemed to be, but it was also effective for the published paper that we were using. So we decided to focus on that concentration. So we continued on with the experiment. Um, and here are a couple of images that uh, show some of the results. These are just interim data, so there's still uh, data being collected. Um, but these are probably the most striking images that I have. Uh, we have three images that kind of compare and contrast the difference between the freshly amputated, so that's in zero days post amputation, um, control flies, and as well as a treated one. Uh, you can see that in the control flies, it just appears to be a, like the freshly amputated uh, image, except for the fact that the tip has been scabbed. However, you can see that there's been pretty drastic growth in the treated fly. Um, this, uh, you can see the amputation side, which is marked with a line in red, and that's where the cuticle and the bristle ends. Um, and we can see that it's increased significantly in length, but also the appearance of the tip has changed drastically. This is another interesting image that just shows how the area of regrowth can change from day to day and from week to week. Uh, the amputation side again is listed in red. And the first image at the top is at 28 days post amputation. Um, and the tip that has regrown is the part that protrudes from the line. Um, and you can see on that first image that the area that has regrown is actually kind of triangular shaped, pointed inwards, and it's not exactly the same width um, or appearance as the original leg itself. However, at 32 days post amputation, we can actually see that the width has changed and has become more similar to the original leg itself, which I find pretty interesting. Another thing to help back up what we found um, is we used mess flies. Uh, these flies are a type of genetically modified fly that have um, fluorescence proteins in their muscles. Uh, and what this allows us to do is use a fluorescence microscope to image the existence or whether the muscle is alive or not within the leg. 
Um, and so you can see there's three images down below, the freshly amputated control that was scabbed and then the treated that were unscabbed. Um, and so you can see that in the freshly amputated image, that's when the muscle is still alive. Um, it's very vibrant. There's a very distinct pattern. That's what is an indicator of the muscle. Um, and then, however, in the control, you can see that there is no pattern visible. You might see a little bit of a dull gray color, but that's that's not the muscle that is just in the cuticle itself. Um, and I outlined the control fly in uh, white for you if you can't see it. Um, but this shows that the muscle is dead um, and that these flies that are untreated, there's no tissue for them to be able to regrow um, and therefore they don't have any regenerative capacity. However, for the treated flies, this is a seven days post amputation, you can see that the vibrancy of the fluorescence is still there um, and the muscle or the ridge pattern is clear, uh, which indicates that the muscle is still alive. And this further reinforces the fact there's still a regenerative capacity for those that are treated. And if it wasn't clear, these images are of the uh, amputation site. So of course, with this project, there were a couple of challenges. Uh, not only did I have to manage a lot of data, whether that be hundreds of photos um, and videos, but also just working with living creatures is difficult in itself. We all think that flies are really annoying, but um, when your data relies on them, it's kind of stressful. Um, they're really small, they're a couple of millimeters big, um, and so they're really sensitive to outside factors. Um, so trying to prevent them from dying and losing that data uh, is pretty difficult, um, especially because this is a pretty time extensive project. As you can see that um, these data points are taken weeks um, and will continue to be taken in intervals over their entire lifespan. So trying to make sure that we are able to collect that data is important. But also, um, this is something I had to learn, which is imaging. It's basically like a new skill I had to learn. Uh, it was pretty frustrating uh, because I had to kind of hand image a lot of these flies and the images that you saw, uh, which meant working with a tweezer and a paintbrush to stop them from moving and taking uh, high quality images. So what's next? So from a project, we were able to see that Dyson is able to coax the start of regeneration. However, we still want to be able to understand Dyson and its role more. So currently, some of the things that are in progress, but I have not been able to show yet, um, is long-term single fly tracking. So this is just being able to monitor a single fly and record pictures of its growth every couple of weeks. And that way we're better to able we're better able to understand and record the regrowth process. Another thing um, is to test and analyze the activity of ictizin receptors. Uh, so we want to be able to understand where ictizin is most active, whether that be in the gut or in the limbs, um, as well as what time period during the post-amputation recovery that it is the most active. And hopefully, once all this is done, we'll be able to have these findings published. Thank you. Questions? So the software is chosen because the generation is coming down very fast. The so, cycle speed up. The generation is coming down very fast. Yeah, they reproduce very quickly. Yes. Right. So if you're talking about something that's uh, regenerating over 32 days after amputation, what percentage of a lifespan? Um, it sometimes it's kind of, it's kind of hard to tell because flies lifespan really depends. Um, but probably the longest that they can live for is two and a half months around, um, maybe three months if they don't like have anything that's really like like environmental factors um, that might harm them or cause them to like die in any way. Um, but yeah. So these treatments, do you know if they are passed down through generations yet? Uh, as in, once they consume it? it yeah, once they consume it. Um, so it does mean it's a steroid hormone, so it's not something that's like genetic. Um, it's just something that 
that's like you ingested kind of like food. Um, so no, it's not like passed down from generation to generation. Is the amputation painful to apply? Is the amputation what? Painful to apply for you now. Um, unfortunately, I don't have information. <laughs> Like if they're turning down and if they're older, obviously I know you can't really see the long term effects if they're older, but so we typically choose flies to amputate between um, two to six days after they come out of their pupa, um, and this is because we don't want them to be too young. Um, so a lot of like really like baby animals, like really young creatures, and even like adult, uh, not adult, uh, babies and humans, um, they actually do have a little bit of a capacity to regenerate when they're younger. Uh, if you know, like, uh, like infants, if you've ever heard of the story of like cutting off the tip of somebody's finger, um, and it's able to like regrow, but you kind of lose that ability when you grow into an adult. Um, the same thing kind of goes for like most creatures, I guess. Possible for our our the lens to help the right the office, the office. Um, as in, uh, like produce like a really long leg, or we've uh, seen a a a one part of the leg regenerate, but then as the the secondary part of the leg, I forgot what it's called, but it has five seconds. That's something we want to continue to observe. So far, um, from the pictures that we've seen, we haven't really seen any joint regrowth for the next segment of the leg, but we do want to find out a way to optimize this regrowth as well as find out if this is possible. I guess. Um, since you were saying that the babies have like a little bit more capacity to regenerate just by themselves, do you think that the education could like help that and make it so that they could actually do it faster and build more questions? That's interesting. I'm not too sure about that question. Um, but we just focus choose to focus on those that are adults because they are um, at least in terms of regenerative capacity are the most similar to us humans. And that's something that we want to focus on. Uh, so you mentioned trying to find a human equivalent of this. Mm -hmm. um, if that was possible, do you think that it would happen on the same time frame as the flies, or do you think that it would take longer because there's more material to regrow? That's an interesting question. Um, I'm not really sure. Um, but at least from what we've seen for flies, um, if the regrowth happens within three to four weeks, um, that's like half of its lifespan, which I get for like an for like a human would be like 40 years or so. Um, that I'm not too sure about. Uh, hopefully in the future, uh, regrowing and doesn't take 40 years, but um, yeah, I'm not too sure about that one. Thank you very much.